So hello everyone. Um, so first of all, let me begin by uh, thanking the organizers for inviting me to speak in this uh, very nice uh, virtual conference. Um, so as the title says today, I would like to speak about this idea of uh, spaces of cubulations. So, so what, what we would like to do is, well, we're going to have some cubulated group, G, um, and ideally we would like to understand all the possible ways that uh, this group can be cubulated in. Uh, so let me begin by uh, fixing uh, the terminology a little bit. Uh, so we say that a group uh, uh, is cubulated if uh, it admits a proper and co-compact uh, action on some Casio cube complex by cubical automorphisms. So isometries that take uh, vertices to vertices, um, which for, for most Casio cube, cube, cube complexes, all isometries are going to have uh, this property. Um, so it, it's been, I should really talk about co-compacted cubulated groups because I think that's what's become a uh, standard terminology. Uh, but I'm, I'm just going to say cubulated throughout the talk for, for simplicity, uh, meaning this notion uh, that I've justified. And, and similarly, a cubulation is going to be any such uh, proper uh, and co-compact action on, on uh, some Casio cube complex of our fixed uh, group G. Um, so yeah, just a quick reminder of, of uh, why people care about Casio cube complexes and why they've received so much attention in, in, in recent years. Uh, so the point is that uh, cubulated groups, so when a group does admit a cubulation, uh, it's known that it satisfies very nice uh, algebraic properties. And so first of all, uh, Casio cube complexes are very special uh, Casio spaces. So uh, any cubulated group is in particular going to be a Casio group. Uh, and this uh, already gives you a, a very uh, nice list of very nice properties. Uh, that I'm go not going to uh, go into right now. Uh, but in addition uh, to these properties, so it's known that uh, cubulated groups satisfy the uh, strong tits alternative, which was already uh, originally shown by um, Sagiv and Wise. Uh, so this means that uh, every subgroup of a cubulated group is either um, virtually abelian or it's going to contain a, a, a non abelian free subgroup. Um, also, cubulated groups are known to have finite asymptotic dimension, which was shown by Wright, uh, and which, for instance, implies the, the Novikov conjecture. Um, but then the, the most interesting properties are, are for those groups that are uh, called virtually special, which is a notion that was introduced by, uh, by Haglund and Wise. And so a large class of cubulated groups uh, is going gonna, is gonna to satisfy uh, this additional uh, notion. And for instance, every uh, hyperbolic group uh, that is cubulated is going to be virtually special by, by the work of, of Ian Nagel. Um, and these virtually special groups are, have really extraordinary property, so properties. So they're going to embed in SN and Z, they're going to be residually finite, uh, rationally solvable, which is a, a very important property when you when you're, want to study fibering questions for, for these groups. You know that all quasi-convex subgroups are going to be separable, where quasi-convex uh, has the usual meaning for hyperbolic groups, but it can also be defined so that this works uh, for all uh, virtually special groups. And, and despite all these great properties that cubulated groups have, uh, the, there's a long list of, of, of very classical groups that are known uh, to be cubulated, they're known to admit cubulations, and so they're known to satisfy these uh, great properties. But today, we're not going to be interested in any uh, of these two, uh, let's say, lines of research, right? We're not going to be interested in cubulating any new groups, and we're not going to be interested in deducing new properties of cubulated groups, uh, at least not immediately. And I guess this is going to be our end goal, but uh, not at this stage. Um, so, as I said, what we would like to do is uh, understand all the cubulations of, of a given uh, cubulated group, in, in some sense. Um, so, uh, before I say more on this, I, I should be a bit careful, I should make things, again, uh, a bit more precise, because I want to study all the possible cubulations of a group, so I should say when two cubulations are going to be the same, and when they're going to be different. Mm -hmm. So, I defined cubulations as, as actions on cube complexes uh, of some type, right, they're going to have to be proper and co-compact. Uh, and we're going to say that two uh, of these actions are the same if uh, there exists an isomorphism between the two Casio cube complexes that conjugates one action into the other. Mm -hmm. So that it's going to be an equivariant isomorphism uh, between the two cube complexes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the basic observation get, that gets this whole uh, idea of the space of cubulations started 
is that uh, when a group does happen to admit accumulation, then it tends to admit infinitely many of them. So infinitely many pairwise distinct ones, uh, where distinct is in, in, in this sense that I've justified. And, and this is interesting. This is perhaps uh, the reason why there's such a long list of, of groups that are known to be accumulated. Because if a group does admit accumulation, it is relatively easy to construct such accumulation and so show that the group is cumulated. So it's not easy at all in practice, but it is easier than it could be, let's say. Uh, and, and this is because, um, uh, because uh, there are so many cumulations, so uh, constructing a cumulation is quite a flexible procedure. You don't have to be too careful, you don't have to arrange things too, too precisely. There's many things you can do that are going to result in a cumulation. Mm -hmm. and, and before I go on, let me actually spend a few more words on this, because I think this is best exemplified by how you cu normally cumulate hyperbolic groups. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a very good procedure to cumulate hyperbolic groups, I mean, when you can, not always, but when you can, um, and, and this procedure uh, comes from the work of Sagiv and uh, Berger and White. Mm -hmm. and, and it roughly goes as follows. So you have your hyperbolic group G that you want to accumulate, uh, and your goal is showing that for any pair of points in the gamma boundary of the group, mm -hmm. you can find a quasi-convex subgroup whose limit set is going to separate uh, these two points at infinity. Mm -hmm. and, and these quasi-convex subgroups will then have to be co-dimension one. Mm -hmm. And, 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 this, and this result of both and Wise tells you that if you can uh, separate any two points in the boundary by the limit set of some quasi-convex subgroup, even though you might have used infinitely many conjugacy classes of, of subgroups in doing so, actually finitely many suffice. And, and these finitely many quasi-convex subgroups are going to be precisely the hyperplane stabilizers of some cubulation. And this exemplifies very well the flexibility you have for cubulations in this setting, right? Because if, you've, if you're cubulating a group this way and, and you have your infinitely many subgroups, you know that finitely many will suffice, but you can always add more. And you're still going to get a cubulation uh, by, by the work of Sagiv, no matter how many uh, quasi-convex subgroups you throw in, as long as you're using finitely many and the co-dimension one, you, you, you're still going to be co-compact and proper. Um, so you have a lot of flexibility when you cubulate groups this way, but this also uh, shows you another important feature, right? So if you have a hyperbolic group that you've cubulated this way, uh, and this is, for instance, the way you cubulate hyperbolic to manifold groups, uh, as one example, uh, if, you, if you cubulate uh, your, your group of this construction, you don't really know any of the cubulations, right? So you, 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 you construct your infinite a collection of subgroups that do all the separation you need, and then some compactness arguments uh, from the work of Bergeron and Weiss tells you that finitely many subgroups suffice, but you don't know which one. Mm. So you know cubulations exist, but you don't really understand any of them in general. Uh, and for instance, for hyperbolic manifold groups in general, it could be that all cubulations have really, really, really high dimension. Um, this is not really uh, understood as far as I know. Mm. And it is certainly known that uh, some hyperbolic manifold groups will not have any cubulations of dimension three. Mm. So uh, this is a such, such a delicate thing, and, and we don't really understand the space of cubulations uh, for many groups, so it is an interesting thing to study. Mm. But let me give you two more con more concrete reasons for studying uh, the space of cubulations of, of a group. And at this stage, I should really be saying, uh, as I wrote here, the collection of cubulations or the set of cubulations of a group, because really, this is just a set. I haven't put any, any additional structure uh, on this uh, just yet. So one is just a classic uh, theme, I would say, maths. So whenever you have a group, uh, it is interesting to study uh, geometric structures associated to the group, mm? which here I mean in this very, very uh, broad sense of, of uh, topological spaces where the fundamental group is my group G, mm? let's say there's no torsion, uh, and so that these spaces are additionally equipped with a metric that, of some kind mm? that has some uh, specific properties. Um, so, for instance, here you can make a natural parallel with the theory of representation varieties, right? So, uh, so if you're interested in studying uh, discrete faithful representations of, of some discrete group into some uh, semi-simple Lie group, uh, then this is, uh, this is equivalent exactly to some problem of this sort, right? You want to understand all the manifolds, uh, whose fundamental group is G, 
again, let's say there's an autosion, and, and plus uh, a metric, a complete Riemannian metric of this, of, on these manifolds that is locally asymmetric to the symmetric space of the leap. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, you, you can phrase this kind of problems in a way that is very similar to this idea of, of, of classifying all tribulations, right? So uh, you might uh, have some symmetric space uh, and a discrete group, and you want to understand all the actions by isometries of your discrete group on your symmetric space, when, where you identify two actions exactly when there exists an isometry of the symmetric space that conjugates one into the other, which is pretty much how I defined uh, two cubulations being the same. Mm -hmm. So for us, in the context of cube complexes, you have to be a bit more uh, general, right? So you should not, while one in the theory of representation varieties, one normally fixes the Lie group, here we cannot uh, fix the universal cover of our spaces. We really have to allow our Casio cube complexes to vary, to obtain some interesting, something interesting going on, uh, because automorphism groups of, of cube complexes are, are, are totally disconnected. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so this is all quite uh, general and abstract. Let me give you an, a more concrete reason uh, why we should study um, the set of cubulations of a group. Uh, and the reason is that this should give us some information on the outer automorphism group of our cubulated group G, uh, and hopefully for quite general groups. So ideally, it would be great to use the, this to study uh, outer automorphism groups of, of, uh, of special groups, and the generality of, of, a, of a special group G. Uh, in the sense of arguing and wise. And so, so actually, let me say, why does uh, out G act uh, on the set of cubulations of G? Well, the point is that whenever you have a, a cubulation of G, in fact, any action on a metric space by G, uh, and whenever you have an, uh, an automorphism of the group G, you can always twist uh, your action by the automorphism. So rather than letting your group elements act on the metric space directly, you first apply your group automorphism to all your group elements, and then you let the, the result act on the metric space. And this is a, a priori, a new action. And it turns out, so if you're twisting by an inner automorphism, then by the definition, uh, by my definition of two cubulations being the same, uh, twisting by an inner automorphism is not going to change the cubulation. Uh, because the inner automorphism is going to be a conjugation by some group element in G, and, and that's exactly the equivariant isomorphism that, that you need to show that the cubulation hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. But in general, if you twist by an outer automorphism, uh, this is going to change the cubulation. Um, and so you, you get an action of, of out G on this set of cubulations, um, and you might hope to use it to say something. Uh, although, again, at this stage, this is just a set. Mm -hmm. And actions on sets don't really carry much information. So, so the the entire goal of, of, of this whole idea uh, of the space of cubulations would be finding a natural topology, some natural metrics that you can put in it, and that are going to be preserved by the action about G, uh, and maybe finding some simplicial combinatorial structure on, on this uh, on this set of cubulations. Right. So, ideally, we would be able to construct some simplicial complex where the vertices are cubulations with some nice properties. Uh, we join two vertices when the corresponding cubulations are close in some sense, and, and, and ideally this, this object would, uh, would carry some interesting information. And this kind of strategy has worked really exceedingly well for outer automorphisms of free groups, right? That's basically the, the whole idea underlying uh, Calvin Bookman's outer space. Um, and and, and th there's some promising results uh, in this direction also for uh, untwisted, out, uh, untwisted outer automorphisms of right angle data groups mm, that are due to Chan, Istanbul, and Volk. Um, okay, so at this stage, uh, I hope I've provided some motivation, but this is all very general, very abstract. So let me give you some uh, more concrete examples. And so first of all, I want to uh, give you more examples of, of this idea that when a group is cubulated, uh, then it normally tends to be so in infinitely many different ways. And, and that this uh, variety of ways is interesting, has some interesting features. Uh, but second, I, I need to uh, show you some, uh, you know, uh, mention some caveats. Uh, so there can also be uh, different cubulations of a group that are different for stupid reasons. And this is, this is really something that we're going to have to be really wary of and we're going to have to uh, work around. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to talk about these non-meaningful ways of, of changing a cubulation in a moment. But first, let's talk about the, the good news, uh, the nice examples. 
So what do I mean when I say that two cubulations are different for meaningful reasons? So first of all, example zero should be uh, anything that's obtained by twisting. So if twisting a cubulation by an alpha automorphism changes the cubulation, then these two cubulations should be, I, I should consider them to be different for meaningful reasons. Exactly because I, I'm, I, one of my motivations is studying automorphism. so uh, anything that, 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 that's come from the action of, of an automorphism, uh, I should be interested in. Uh, so now looking at a specific group, so if we look at uh, a non-abelian free group, um, then you, a natural uh, collection of cubulations that you, that you can look at are exactly one-dimensional cubulations, the, which in, in, in this setting are uh, quite an, an interesting class, right? Uh, and so these are just proper and co-compact actions on, on simplicial trees. Uh, and these are exactly, they more or less make up uh, the Kalman Volkman outer space. So uh, any two simplices in, in outer space are uh, going to correspond to uh, two cubulations, to one dimensional cubulations of the free group. Uh, so I, I'm saying any two simplices or equivalently any two vertices in the, in the spine of outer space. Um, and any, if you take different simplices, the cubulations are going to be different, and, and I, I am going to consider them to be them to be different for meaningful reasons. Because in, in doing this whole construction of the space uh, of outer space, you are using the geometry of the free group. You are using the free groups are fundamental groups of graphs. So this is specific to this setting. Um, so a second example that we can look at naturally are, are closed uh, surface groups. Mm -hmm. And here, so whenever you have a, a multi-curve on your closed surface, uh, well, uh, you can lift it to the universal cover and you, and you can consider some dual object to, to the collection of, of lifts of these curves uh, in the universal cover. And, and by Sagiv's construction, this uh, yields a, a, a co-compact action on a Casio cube complex. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm looking at finite multi-curves. Uh, and if you moreover ask that your multicurves are filling, uh, then you gain properness of the action. And so uh, any filling multicurve gives you a cubulation of your surface group, uh, where filling uh, here means that it cuts your surface into a collection of disks. Um, and now if you take different multicurves, so non-isotopic, then you're going to get different cubulations, uh, where different is again in the sense above. Uh, and again, I am considering these different cubulations to be different for meaningful reasons, because this whole uh, thing is based on the geometry of the surface. Mm. Um, and then, uh, finally, you can uh, extend this example of, of surfaces to closed uh, hyperbolic free manifolds. Uh, and here, instead of multicolors, you're going to use uh, finite collections of quasi-convex uh, immersed surfaces. Mm. And uh, the fact that you have a lot of them and enough to, to have many interesting cubulations uh, comes from the work of Kahn Markovich, who showed that uh, you really have a lot of uh, quasi function uh, surfaces in M in any closed hyperbolic free manifold. Um, and so, again, uh, any uh, sufficiently large collection of, of surfaces is going to give you a cubulation. Uh, and let me point out that here in these last two examples for, for surfaces in hyperbolic free manifolds, um, if you throw in enough curves or enough surfaces, you can make uh, the dimension of, of the zero cube complex arbitrarily high. And so even for a fixed surface, you can make uh, cubulations uh, with dimension tending to infinity, um, which is different from my first example, where everything we were looking at was one dimensional. Okay, so these are all uh, nice examples because they're based on the geometry of these very specific groups. Uh, so examples that are not meaningful, ways of changing accumulation that are not meaningful because they don't, they're not based on the geometry of some group are the following. So let me uh, show them to you in the case of Z acting on the real line. So a very simple example, but they, they work in absolute generality. So we cubulate the real line by uh, putting a, a, a vertex at every integer point, then we join them by edges in the obvious way, and then uh, Z translates one notch to the right in, in the obvious way. So there's, there's two procedures. Uh, I'm going to call them procedure A and procedure B. And as I said, they work more generally, and they're going to come up later in the talk. So uh, please uh, try to remember them. Uh, um, so it, it, procedure A consists in attaching a loose edge uh, here to every vertex, just a loose edge sticking up and going nowhere. 
And the CGP consists in blowing up every edge uh, to a square. And so you get a chain of, of squares uh, attached uh, along diagonally opposite vertices. And then Z still translates, still has your complexes, actions are still proper and compact, but things are, are different from before. Uh, and then there's a third procedure, so procedure C, uh, which is just very centrically subdividing. Mm -hmm. So I'm drawing it for a tree because in R, uh, it would change the metric, but it wouldn't uh, change my picture of it. <laughs> so uh, it's better this way. So here, uh, it's one dimensional setting. We're just uh, adding uh, midpoints uh, of, of edges uh, as vertices. Mm -hmm. So these three procedures, as I said, they can be performed on absolutely any accumulation of any accumulated group, and they are going to give you a new accumulation. So these procedures cannot carry any interesting information because they do not depend on the specific group in any way. Um, and so actually, let me say a few more words on why they work on any accumulation. Well, very centrically subdividing, uh, this is uh, you know, quite clear. You can always very centrically subdivide a cube complex. Uh, and you can view this as, as replacing every hyperplane of the cube complex with two parallel copies of itself. Uh, attached loose edges is also something you can do quite generally, right? You, you are going to have some tubulation, you pick one G orbit of vertices, and you attach a loose edge to every um, vertex in this G orbit. You do it equivariantly, you equivariantly extend the, the, the action, uh, and, and you're going to get your tubulation. Um, Procedure B is maybe the one that requires uh, a little more thought, right? Because we want to blow up every edge to a square in a sense, uh, but we want to retain uh, the fact that we have a K0 cube complex and also that the action is proper and co compact. Um, but the way you should really think about this um, is that this is a modified barycentric subdivision. So rather than uh, blowing up every hyperplane to two, par parallel, to par to two parallel copies of itself, we are going to blow up every hyperplane to two transverse uh, copies of itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and this can be formulated quite easily in terms of the half space box set of, of the cube complex. And, and, uh, and, and, and so this works in absolute general. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, but since these procedures, uh, so these procedures tell you that any cubulated group is going to have infinitely many cubulations. Uh, but this is for very stupid reasons and for very uninteresting reasons. It's not the cool ways of having infinitely many tubulations that I, that I showed here on the left. It's, it, it's an annoying way that is going to make the, the space of tubulations of any group infinite and very large for, for, for no good reason, basically. So we want to avoid uh, these procedures, and the way to go is to restrict to Kaziokib complexes that are nice in, in, some, in some way. So we're going to um, assume that they satisfy these uh, two assumptions, uh, being essential and being hyperplane essential. And this is going to stop us from performing at least procedures A and B. So very centric subdivisions are not going to be a problem, not immediately. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about them uh, later on. Uh, so we say that a Casio cube complex is essential. Uh, this definition is due to Sagiv and uh, to Capras and Sagiv. Um, a cube complex is essential if um, none of its half spaces is at finite house of distance from the hyperplane that defines the half space. Mm -hmm. uh, and so procedure A always results in something that's not essential. Um, and so you see it here in this picture, right? So whenever I attach a loose edge, mm, uh, I'm creating a hyperplane, uh, namely the uh, midpoint of this loose, loose edge is going to be a hyperplane. And, and the top tip of the, of the loose edge is going to be a half space uh, determined by this hyperplane that is uh, at bounded distance from, from the hyperplane. So it, it, it kills essentiality. Uh, and on the other hand, we say that a Kaziokli complex is a hyperplane essential if each hyperplane is itself an essential Kaziokib complex. And here it's important to notice that hyperplanes of Kaziokib complexes have themselves a structure of a Kaziokib complex. Basically, because we can look at all the cubes of our Kaziokib complex X and we can intersect them with any given hyperplane. And this decomposes every given hyperplane in, in lower into lower dimensional cubes. So it gives every hyperplane a structure of, 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 cube, com of cube complex which actually it turns out to be uh, a structure of K0 cube complex. Mm -hmm. And so we can ask that the, that the hyperplanes with these uh, induced cubical structures are essential in the sense of this definition here. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see procedure B always results in a, in a cube complex that's not hyperplane essential. Mm -hmm. 
it, it will preserve essentiality of the whole cube complex, but it will not. But it, it will always kill um, essentiality of the hyperplanes. So in this picture, we're looking again at the chain of squares above. Uh, and uh, you see hyperplanes are going to be these uh, parallel, uh, these segments parallel to the size of the squares, but going through the middle. Uh, and this hyperplane it, it does not violate essentiality of the whole cube complex because they can move infinitely far left and right. So they have spaces go infinitely far from the hyperplane. But if I look at essentiality of the hyperplane itself, well, the cubical structure on the hyperplane is this. It's just a segment. Uh, there's two vertices joined by an edge, and, and this guy does have one hyperplane uh, whose two sides are bounded, and, and, and this is uh, this is bad. Okay, so a uh, couple of remarks. All the cubulations in examples one, two, three are essential and hyperplane essential. So the cubulations, uh, the specific cubulations of, of these specific groups that are constructed here are all essential and hyperplane essential. Mm -hmm. So these are not some crazy notions. Uh, and secondly, it is not really restrictive to um, only look at essential, uh, have been essential tribulations because Hagen and Tuikan um, developed this procedure called panel collapse that allows you to start from any tribulation of any group and, and uh, do some cuttings and end up with a uh, tribulation that is now essential and hyperplane essential. Mm -hmm. So this procedure is going to change many properties of the original tribulation. But it is also going to retain some of them. But the important thing here is that every cubulated group will actually have also essential and hyperplane essential cubulations. Uh, and so, if we if we only look at these uh, these uh, cubulations satisfying these properties, uh, it is not restrictive. It's not going to be a, a smaller class than the class of cubulated groups. And so, these are a good candidate for the space of uh, of cubulations of of, uh, of a group because they avoid all this uh, useless uh, stuff uh, caused by, by um, procedures A, B, and C. OK, so after this long uh, overview, let me give you some results. Um, so the first one uh, is it connects to what I was saying before, right? So that at this stage, we only have a set of cubulations, uh, and we want some additional structure. Uh, and for sure, the first thing to, to do is put a topology on this uh, set of cubulations. Um, and so there is one thing that you can do, right? You have the Gromov, the equivariant uh, Gromov house of topology. Uh, so this is a very natural notion of closeness of two actions. It actually works for actions on any metric spaces, right? Uh, whenever you have a collection of actions of your group on, on, on uh, some metric spaces, you can always uh, consider the equivariant Gromov house of uh, topology on this collection. But it's very hard to understand what uh, this looks like if you don't have a model, uh, a model space for, for your um, space of cubulations. And so a different strategy would be uh, embedding uh, your space of cubulations into some vector space, ideally some linear space, and considering the subspace topology. Because there we would understand a lot better what the properties of this topology are. Uh, and so this is achieved via length functions, right? So the idea is that we want to transform cubulations so, into functions on the group, because functions of the group are, are, are something that is uh, a lot uh, easier to understand, in a sense. Um, and so this is done via length functions. So uh, every cubulation is a, an action on a cube complex uh, that is proper and compact. And to each such action, we can associate the function uh, from the group to the non-negative reals that uh, assigns to every group element its translation length inside the cube complex. So the least displacement uh, of, a, of a point of the cube complex by this specific group element. Uh, we call this uh, the length function of the, of the cubulation. And it's immediate to notice that if two, cubulation, two cubulations are the same, as I defined it above, then they're going to have the same length function. Um, but then you can wonder if the converse holds, right? Are cubulations with the same length, length function going to be the same? Um, and here, procedures A and B already uh, kill this hope in full generality, right? So even if you allow only procedure A or only procedure B, uh, then starting from any cubulation of any group, you can construct infinitely many that are pairwise uh, different, pairwise not the same. Uh, but pairwise have the same length function. Uh, and so this is, this is bad. But this is not worrying because 
uh, all these pairways, uh, different tubulations with the same length function are constructed via procedures A and B, which we've already decided are not interesting to us. Uh, and indeed, if we restrict to essential and hyperplane essential things, uh, things are, are a lot better behaved. Uh, so here's something that they proved with uh, Jonas Beira uh, last year. So first of all, if the group G is gram of hyperbolic and tubulated, um, then everything works uh, perfectly well. So two essential hyperplane essential tubulations uh, of G are the same if and only if they have the same length function. Um, and secondly, if you want to look, about, uh, look at non-hyperbolic groups, uh, then the same result holds. So two tubulations are the same if and only if they share the same length function. Assuming, I mean, as long as you, as you uh, consider tubulations satisfy, satisfying some additional assumptions, so first of all, they should be reducible, so they should not split as a product, uh, which is something that was implicit here. It, it followed from hyperbolicity of the group. Um, and moreover, they should have no free faces. Or equivalently, the Casio metrics should be uh, judicially complete. Uh, and having no free faces, is a, it implies, in particular, essentiality and hyperplane essentiality, but it is a stronger assumption. Mm -hmm. So it's like asking not just that hyperplanes are essential cube complexes, but also that any intersection of hyperplanes is an essential cube complex. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, under this stronger assumption that there are no free faces, part two holds also for things that are not cubulations. So it, it works for more general actions on Casio cube complexes, uh, where you might not be proper and you might not be co-compact. Uh, it's enough that you have uh, some non-elementarity, so there should be no finite orbit at infinity in the visual boundary, no fixed point inside the cube complex, and you should have some minimality. So there should be no proper convex subcomplex that is left invariant by the action. Uh, okay, so now that we now that we have this result on length functions, we can uh, embed the set of tubulations of G into the the topological vector space of of uh, of real valued functions on the group, and, and so we get a topology on the space of tubulations. Uh, and in fact, if we only look at tubulations up to homotheties, then we also get an embedding of the space of tubulations into um, into uh, projectivized length functions, which are a, an infinite dimensional projective space. Uh, and in my work with Jonas Spira, we also showed that uh, the closure of the set of tubulations of G, uh, satisfying these properties, uh, the, the assumptions of this theorem, um, the closure of the, of, of the set of tubulations inside this infinite dimensional projective space is compact. Uh, and so you, you get a compactification of, uh, of this uh, set uh, of tubulations. Uh, and, and this is really an analog of how you compactify Tachmuller space by adding the first and boundary. Or uh, it's also an analog of the usual compactification of, of outer space in the setting of free groups. Um, and, and just like in those two cases, uh, for Tachmuller space or for outer space, the boundary points can be interpreted as group actions on real trees, where you might lose properness, but still relatively nice actions on, on real trees. Here in this setting, you can also do the same. So uh, points, uh, boundary points in this compactification can be viewed as degenerations of, of sequences of tubulations. Uh, and these are going to be actions on, on median spaces, which are sort of a non-discrete uh, analog of cube complexes uh, with some properties. So again, these are going to be non-proper actions on median spaces, but they are still going to have some, some uh, niceness conditions that they satisfy. Uh, and this is, a, I believe, a very interesting thing to study for uh, to understand uh, automorphisms uh, of, of, of special groups in general, for instance. Um, and actually, let me conclude with one last result, uh, this time joined with Mark Hagen, also from last year, um, which also answers a natural question uh, regarding this space of essential, have been essential uh, actions. So uh, let me recall that what I said before, so by panel collapse, uh, which was developed by Hagen and Tuikan, uh, every cubulated group actually admits at least one essential, hyperplane essential cubulation. Mm -hmm. But the natural question now is, does every cubulated group admit infinitely many essential and hyperplane essential cubulations? Mm -hmm. So is, is there some other procedure other than A, B, and C that I described above that will always uh, modify accumulation, retaining essentiality and hyperplane essentiality, but that will be not meaningful for some reason, uh, because it will for some reason work in, uh, for every accumulation. 
Uh, and the answer is no. So there are no more stupid ways of deforming accumulation. And for instance, if you look at Berger Moses groups, uh, then they're going to have a unique uh, accumulation that is essential, hyperplane essential, uh, and uh, with no parallel hyperplanes. So here, by no parallel hyperplanes, I mean no pairs of hyperplanes that they look like they've come from a very centric subdivision. And before, when we were talking about length functions, uh, barycentric subdivisions were not a problem because they modify the metric on the cube complex, and so I am going to see that in the length function. But here, they, they modify the cubical structure, and so uh, they do give me something different, uh, and I need to rule it out. But if you, if you, if you, if you, if you not allow us to use procedures A, B, and C, then there exists a unique cubulation of every Berger Moses group. Uh, and let me point out that this result really, we've just assembled lots of very deep results of other people. And so, uh, Chatterjee Fenos Yotzi, super rigidity, uh, goes in here. Uh, there's some results of Capras and Demetz on auto, automorphism groups of trees that go into this proof. Uh, there's some, some of the work of Shalom, and there's also, of course, the work of Berger Moses and, and Berger Moses Zimmer. And putting everything together with a few lemmas and cube complexes yields this result. What, I, what we've actually really uh, shown, uh, together with Mark Hagen, is the second part, that for cubulated non-elementary hyperbolic groups, the picture is completely different. They always have infinitely many essential hyperplane essential cubulations with no parallel hyperplanes. So what we observed for uh, free groups, surface groups, and hyperbolic manifold groups, it is actually a general property of all cubulated uh, hyperbolic groups. Uh, and here, uh, specialness uh, plays a big role in this proof. Uh, so it would be interesting to know if this holds for all uh, virtually special groups, uh, because our proof actually also really needs hyperbolicity a lot. Uh, and let me just point out to conclude that this result is clear if the outer automorphism group of G is infinite. But the point is that many hyperbolic groups have finite outer automorphism uh, groups, for instance, all hyperbolic Fermanifold groups. And in general, anything that's not assembled from free groups and, and surface groups uh, will have finite outer automorphism group. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, yeah, you, you need to do something different in that case. Uh, so, yeah, I, I will stop here. And thank you a lot for listening. Uh, and, yeah, I hope uh, everyone is doing well. Uh, and see you soon.